everyone, and welcome back to the Digital Dissection Podcast. Today is kind of a bittersweet episode for us as we look fondly back upon a, a bright spot in our childhood, but at the same time, one of the brightest spots that childhood has has just dimmed. And due to the passing of Jason David Frank and his tragic suicide, we do want to acknowledge the very serious public health problem and that resources are available for those suffering. Help can be found by dialing 988 in the United States 24 hours a day at the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Additional help can be found online at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org. We will be sharing international resources in our show notes. Joe, admittedly, it has been a tough year, but particularly recently, as yes, we've had to say goodbye to some folks that have absolutely impacted, you know, our pop culture lives mm -hmm. and, and not just one property. It's, it's kind of sad to, to say, and I, I think it would be, I don't know if irresponsible is the right word, but it, it would feel a little off to be bubbly to begin this episode as we have literally watched and witnessed Jason David Frank being laid to rest this afternoon. I I, I agree 100%. It has been um, absolutely rough um, with the uh, the passing of Kevin Conroy, uh, and even even more so with Jason David Frank, um, just because of the different natures of their passing and how much each of those characters meant to us. Uh, that they that they provided over the years through our childhood and and into our adulthood to say that um, you know either one of them were just there for your kids like they were still out there doing things they're still out there producing and making content for us to enjoy and both of them understood that their audiences grew and that it couldn't be the same thing over and over again and especially these two when you look at con going celebrities. Yes, they do. They do enjoy being there. They enjoy act interacting with their audiences, but I think it would be hard pressed to find two people who enjoy that environment more than Jason, David Frank and Kevin Conroy, Kevin Conroy, who literally pushed his body in its ailing state in his ailing state. Um, to make sure that his fans got to see him when he, he knew that his time was, was getting slimmer and Jason David Frank, who just, he adored his fans. He looked forward to interacting with us. I think as one of the, the most thing, like it was the most, one of the few, one of the things that he just looked forward to the most and sorry for my speech being a little off. It's just, <sighs> Something that will always stick out in my mind um, with Jason David Frank is I remember seeing him uh, at Wizard World in Madison, Wisconsin. It was the first time that con had made it to our state. And I was working for a private Catholic school uh, and making no money. I was, I think, was living uh, in, a, in even a pretty low rent environment. And if it wasn't for Mark here, I wouldn't have even had the chance to meet a celebrity because Mark was the one who paid for us to meet Ernie Hudson. I literally had enough money to gas up my car to go there to pay for the getting into the event. And, and that was it. Like I had money for nothing else, but I remember walking around the convention floor and just at one point among the clatter of, of like a, of a busy area, you just heard one voice kind of breaking through all of it. And it was, everyone ready? Let's do this. And then you heard like a small, like a, you heard a cheering. And then you just hear it's morphin' time. And you look over and it's Jason David Frank jumped up onto his table <laughs> and just getting everyone in line with him, absolutely pumped and happy to see him. And this was the norm for him. He was always, always, always grateful for his fans to see him. Uh, I remember there are instances of him being outside like comic book shops from signings and he stopped his crowd because he said, Hey, everyone, 
I just heard someone tell this to me and I feel like I have to say it out loud. And it was that, hey, I'm sorry, you probably hear this a thousand times a day and you're probably sick of hearing it, but you were my hero when I was when I was growing up. And he said, I want everyone to hear this right now. Anyone who is sick of hearing people tell them that they are your hero doesn't deserve to be your hero. I love and cherish every single one of you who come out to see me, who've been with me through the years and have taken anything that I've said to heart and that has helped you through your day means more to me than anything else. He was just someone who is excited about his life, who is excited about his passions and put everything he into, just put everything into everything he did. So to have this darkness kind of like welling up inside of him and overwhelm him in a single moment of his life is, it's nothing short of tragic. And honestly, like I don't, I can't think of um, a public figure who's passed in my lifetime that literally has hit quite as hard as this has. Yeah. Uh, and you and I relied on that too. We, we mentioned that how, well, I mean, just to take everybody back to last week, which was just a really horrible week. Uh, and I hate to say that during Thanksgiving week as well, but it, it, I remember I texted you cause you hadn't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I was absolutely hoping that it was not true. Like I, I saw it pretty early, um, the day that he passed away and I didn't want it to be true. I, I just sat there shaking my head like, no, 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 this, this, this didn't happen. Somebody's just doing one of those like pranks or something. Mm -hmm. And as that reality set in, you know, in the early morning, like, holy shit, this is real. Like he's gone. Uh, it, it just, it took me back to part of that, that kid that was moving around a lot in the military and, you know, I had my family and I had my, my toys and everything and life was fine. But this, this was the guy that I was, you know, trying to model myself after, you know, not pretending to be karate, you know, had doing karate mm -hmm. or anything, but this was the guy that caught my attention on TV. And so, you know, looking up to him in a lot of ways and just realizing how long ago that was, it made me feel even further to hear his, his passing. And the only other time I've actually gotten this upset about a, uh, a public figure passing, like you mentioned, and I, I, I hate to say it that way, but when uh, Chester Bennington passed away, yeah, it was the same kind of gut punch. Like I just felt hollow. I, I just felt cold and you just sit there in disbelief and yeah, yeah, it, it, there's no other way to really talk about it. It was just so, it is so tragic to know how positive an influence he's been on people and he made it a point. And so the, the thing I always say about situations like this is that I, I'm not going to try to understand what was going through his mind because I don't think I can get there. What I will do is help anyone who thinks they feel even an inch close to that. And yeah, that's, that's about, uh, where, where I've stood on that one. And, um, either way, it's, 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 it's going to be a rough situation. I know you and I have both been pretty gutted over this for good reason. It's, uh, it's, it's just, a, it's just a rough situation. And mm -hmm. the, the one thing I will say, and I'll, I'll give you, the, I'll give you the, the mic back here is that it seems like everyone that knew him it, or had even just felt his impact is, is out there talking about it now. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing I'm kind of clinging to is that the people who knew him really, really well, 
you know, we didn't, obviously we didn't know him well. <laughs> we just, we saw him at the same comic con. I saw him a few years before that. And he, he pointed at me when I was in my ghostbuster outfit, <laughs> he pointed right at me and I pointed right back at him, you know? And, uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to find some peace with then is that mm -hmm. he, he had a huge impact on people and it's a shame that the ones that are always giving are the ones hurting the most. <sighs> so really, really pumped up episode folks. We appreciate you joining yeah. in. <laughs> what we're here to do today is, is, is celebrate despite the tone guys. We know it's a tough, it's a tough topic. We know, but Joe and I decided we were going to change things around a little bit because his, his influence on, on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was very quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, it completely changed the franchise despite the, the very small amount of subject matter that they could actually draw from. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's not, um, it's not normal for a TV show to have a five part series dedicated to one character. Mm -hmm. It's it's not normal for a TV show, let alone a, again, like, I don't want to say children's TV show, but it was designed for a specific audience between the ages, I believe, the target audience was 8 and 13. Like, yeah. that, was, that was what they were going for. And to have that much depth into a storyline was unheard of uh, before this was done. So looking at the impact that... Um, Jason David Frank's performance as Tommy Oliver had on that audience. And, you know, since then, like it is not me speaking like out of, um, out of light of recent events, but it is literally nothing like green with evil has been done since there yeah. has not been in my mind, anything in, in like TV in a TV series that has this high of stakes and made you just on the inch of your seat for five straight episodes. Um, that was also, I would have to say at, at this level in then like we, you can look at like HBO level things. Like obviously game of Thrones had you on your seat every episode. Um, and that was different because that had this massive production behind it. Whereas the, this was literally, taking something that already been made and just kind of rewrapping it and repackaging it. And I would argue that when you look at the source material versus what we got here in the United States, um, green with evil was something different and you could not, it's, it's hard to come like, it's so weird because again, using the same action footage, it's hard to compare the two with each other. It so, really is. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> There is, there is one comparison that I think people will recognize because if you didn't as a kid, you definitely will now. And that is the difference between the hard armor Green Ranger and <laughs> the soft plushy yes. Green Ranger that we, <laughs> where you could clearly tell where the Japanese <laughs> clips came from mm -hmm. and then where they hastily put together the, the stuff they didn't want to spend a lot of money on in the U S <laughs> <Yeah. If>, um, <laughs> which, which we've heard reinforced by, by David Fielding, mm -hmm. uh, Zordon. He even said the same thing. He's like, yeah, yeah. they, they wouldn't even fly me out to Australia for the movie. That's how cheap <laughs> things were. <laughs> I mean, I think cause eventually the, the power Rangers does move to Disney, uh, from, uh, Saban. And yeah. when, uh, when Jason even Frank, of course, worked with both of them. And he said, if there's one thing Saban and Disney have in common, it's that they're both cheap. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so speaking to that matter, we have covered a little bit about, um, where Power Rangers got its real start from. Uh, and that was, of course, this long running Super Sentai series, uh, that has been going on literally since the 1970s in Japan. And it has this kind of really set, um, uh, formula to it where every season is a standalone season. And you get new characters, new costumes, new villains, new robots, new everything each season. So yeah. when you had like Westerners go to Japan and see this for the first time, they would say, Hey, this is fantastic. There's lots of action, bright colors. There are huge robots. Like, why are we not doing something with this in the United States or something like this? 
And one of the first people to do that and think they could make money off of it was none other than Stan the Man Lee himself. Mm -hmm. As he came back to the United States from Japan and said, hey, look at this. This is great. We should do something this Marvel. And they're like, Stan, X-Men, Spider-Man, the Hulk, we love it all. Don't ever fucking talk to us about Super Sentai again. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> this is great for you. But we want to do something different, Stan. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, something interesting about Stan Lee was there's a video circulating now in the passing of obviously JDF where he surprises him on stage and he has, he has no idea that he's coming and it's, it's surreal to see both of them, especially mm -hmm. since they're both not with us anymore. But but Stan Lee comes out there and he gives JDF a, a big old hug and is, <laughs> and, and he goes, um, are they treating you okay out here? How you doing? And he just goes, just goes in for it. And, and JDF is like, he, he's starstruck. Yeah. I mean, for, for him to be starstruck at that point, that tells you something mm -hmm. about just how humble this guy was, but he, he can barely get words out. And, uh, <laughs> it, I, I just want to say that like, any memories that come up like that, mm -hmm. I, I hope people truly can sit back and enjoy them. That, yeah. that, that's just, uh, it's just interesting how mm -hmm. those paths didn't converge because Stan Lee got the green light. <laughs> yeah. did because <laughs> they, they both remain so immensely mm -hmm. popular on, on a parallel then eventually, you know, oh. cross paths again. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think, the more we can see con footage of those two, um, it's, I think we're going to see more of it even come out. That maybe we hadn't seen before because people are now getting around to posting things that they may have thought, uh, you know, it's just con footage. I'm sure everyone has this out there. I'm not going to do it. And then it turns out we may find more hidden gems like that. And I hope yeah. we do. So, you know, if you've, you've had the chance to meet either of these two at a con, you know, put your video out there. Um, yeah. really, I think it's a fun yeah. way to remember what they did. Um, but getting, getting back to, um, how Power Rangers really got going. Like I said, we, we've, we've talked before when David Fielding was on over Heim Saban actually successfully, successfully does this where he has this great idea where we're just going to take all the expensive stuff, the expensive things to shoot and just buy that from Japan at what would cost us less than to actually shoot it. And mm -hmm. then we film the rest for the localized storyline with like unknown actors at the time and uh, cheaply made sets and it'll be great. So he goes to Fox with this um, and it, it seems to, to one person, Margaret Loesch, uh, that this is going to be a great idea. And when she presented it to the other heads at Fox, they're like, you know what? You can endorse this, but if it fails, it's your ass and you're mm -hmm. and you're out. And she ends up running Fox Kids because of how successful Power Rangers ended up being. And the series that it's based off of is uh, Kaio Ryu Sentai Jiu Ranger, which is just basically um, what we got in the States. It is dinosaur themed um, heroes and stories are dramatically different and i have to say a lot darker in japan <laughs> because great. rita repulses character bandora uh who which by the way in the first episode of power rangers you can see the first time they zoom up on rita repulses uh castle on the moon you can see it says bandora palace on it still yes, and they, didn't, yes. they didn't catch that but <laughs> yeah in her episodes she's straight up trying to kill children and i think succeeds a couple times so very 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 dark but literally all that stuff from Japan at that time, that series was, you know, done and over with in 1992. So when Power Rangers premiered in 1993, it was the most recent series. So all the production shots from Japan looked pretty crisp as far as television like con was concerned at the time. Yeah. And they shipped yeah. crisp ish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, like they agreed, uh, Toei like actually shipped like as many things over as they could from Japan. So when they had to reuse things or reshoot things with the American actors in the suits and costumes, they could. Except not all the parts survived, including the mm. original nice thick dragon shield that yeah. didn't make it. So we ended up getting the the uh, the flimsy like wish version. One. Yeah. yeah, the, the wish the wish version of the mm -hmm. Green Ranger shield. Yeah, 
Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when we now see how that's been working pretty successfully for 16 episodes and when I mean successfully, like it was like, it took the States by storm. Like yeah, it did William. like gangbusters with, uh, you had the, the rock and heavy riffing, um, guitar solo that came out to start every episode. Um, you had teenagers who were all cool into either martial arts or hip hop or really smart, uh, or like gymnastics. Like it was like, they did all of the things that literally all of the kids in the United States liked. We got, we got mm-hmm. rollerblades. We've got overalls. We've got hip hop Kaido. We've yes. got a juice bar where like barely anybody drinks any juice, and, and and yeah, obviously karate was everywhere. Karate, so mm-hmm. kind so of it. yeah, it it absolutely just worked. And then we hit episodes seventeen through twenty two, known as Green with Evil, and mm. which is just you know fun play on Green with Envy, but this time we get yes. evil. Uh, so this is where. Jason David Frank comes in to the United States audience because he auditioned at the same time as the other five Rangers, as other That's five right. stars. Yep. So the same time as Amy Jo Johnson, Thuy Trang, David Yost, Walter Jones, and Austin St. John. And actually, um, Jason David Frank auditioned for the role of Jason Lee Scott. Yes. Mm-hmm. Just narrowly lost out. I'm guessing they were like, you know what? Let's hold off on the ponytails for just yes. a moment. Mm-hmm. You know, let let's see how a straight laced guy with a pretty pretty sick fade. Let's see what mm-hmm. he's got going on. Yeah, yeah, we we yeah. like this guy. Like we're gonna we're gonna go with him. But however, JDF, don't go anywhere because yeah. this is just the first of many of these great ideas that we have. And we've got a feeling that this Austin St. John guy he might try to rip off people financially at some point. He we could. Just, we, <laughs> We can't quite put a thumb on it yet, but we, we just got a feeling. So stick around, okay? Explore Which, the space. Even though I am I am wearing one of Austin St. John's shirts right now, by the way, from his <laughs> Battle Rex line. Which, of course, I bought Tommy's shirt from Austin St. John's company. But anyway, yeah. um, so they're like, you know, JDF, don't go anywhere. Because we've got this other character coming up in the original show. He makes it six episodes. Uh, we'll bring you on. Like, no, he, he makes it for a while, but then the character dies. So he's a temporary character. Uh, we'll bring yes. you on for him. But also, we've got this other great show called Cybertron we're thinking of. And yes. we're going to have you be the lead for that. And so you actually get to see um, JDF actually try out. And the whole pilot for Cybertron is there, which if you are in any way at all nerdy and followed things from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, you'll realize that's the home of the Transformers, and there's no way that name was going to fly for a series. <laughs> so it gets changed to VR Troopers. Um, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, do, do people of that demographic listen to this program? Is that what you're trying to get across? Um, it's a long shot. I know we technically market to that demographic with the whole nerd podcast thing, but at the same time, I thought we were more of like, you know, the, the coffee and donut crowd of people who just go and work on their novels or their homework, uh, at, at the local coffee shop. And we are nothing but highbrow entertainment here. Yeah. I was going to say, I thought we were going after the, like that boomer era that has mm-hmm. Werther's original in their pockets and is scared of the internet, but that, mm-hmm. that just might be me. No. Yeah. yeah. But- so to your, <laughs> sorry, to, to your <laughs> point, Joe, that's something a lot of us didn't know when we mm-hmm. first watched Power Rangers was that the Green Ranger does actually die over in Japan. And the stories are similar, but they, they do diverge after a mm-hmm. point because rather than have a Green Ranger who gets like brainwashed into being evil. Mm -hmm. The green ranger is kind of brought in as like this reluctant partner of the quote unquote rangers at that point in time. And then finds out, you know what? I, I I think I'm going to play both sides. So that way I'm always winning, (laughs) (laughs) but he defects, he defects over Mm -hmm. to, to Rita. And, and then he ends up getting 86th. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was very much. There was a, a grudge he had with the uh, Red Tyranno Ranger. Uh, it was like yeah. a, like a literally like a family thing that had been going on for many many a generation. Uh, and so when he was resurrected to try and help the rest of the uh, the G Rangers, it turned out he was like, "No, fuck all of you. 
I'm going to kick your ass and uh, I suppose work with the Bandora witch as long as it suits my interests sort of thing. So he, he straight yeah. up just goes, fuck this shit. Where the hood at? And he just goes walking <laughs> off looking for Rita. <laughs> uh, that's, I believe his exact words as he broke into, um, I, 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 the name that they use for the Megazord in, uh, the Japanese version is escaping me, but that is what happened when he goes in for the first time and all the Rangers are surprised, like, oh, gasp, the Green Ranger's just there saying, where the hood at? And then he just kind yeah. of messes them up, <laughs> throws them all out what of the What it going to be? So, <laughs> what it going to be? What it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> so now we get to the States and we've got to translate this storyline to like an American audience. And while that actually, the actual storyline from Jew Ranger actually is not bad. Um, it is got this fun, like grudge revenge and then realization and like redemption, like story all in one. Instead here we get the new guy comes into town and he is pretty much instantly presented as an equal to Jason. So we mm -hmm. get to establish this like, okay, Here's this new guy. He's not to be trifled with because we see him right away in a martial arts tournament that ends in a draw against Jason Lee Scott, where neither of them win. And on top of that, this guy's got cool long hair. I don't think he has a piercing because this is Fox Kids, and that's a bit too much. Um, he, had, he had a rockin' headband, though. Rockin' headband, absolutely. Yeah. And... and yeah. Oh, was a, and like everyone else on the show, was rocking a primary color which is yes. a dead giveaway of what his destiny is going to be. Because <laughs> one, one of the best lines in all of Power Rangers, like any series ever, I think happens off in like Ninja Storm, where there's something happens and the heroes are confused and a lot of other things, a lot of other villains are showing up and there's so many and they're overwhelmed. And War Ranger says to the other, there's so many people here. How will we know who to fight? And then the other one says, it's easy. Just look for people not wearing primary colors. And then they just go off and do things and they go off fighting. So <laughs> they become very self-aware, which was fantastic because for some needed humor, the series needs. But yeah. so they've got that same kind of vibe that the other Rangers have. And Tommy is instantly like, kind of like just by his mere presence swoons Kimberly. Uh, oh, he's just like, George, Oof, fallen for this man. It's, just it's not even like, it's not even three minutes into the episode. Like, like <laughs> Trini and Kimberly are, are just, like kind of talking to each other about mm -hmm. just what's going on. And Kimberly, you can just like her ovaries are just like on fire. Like she's, <laughs> she's just absolutely enamored with mm -hmm. this dude. And, and the thing is Austin St. John at this point in time, I mean, he's a mountain of man meat. Okay. He is. Like, yeah, like he's a big dude. He's like, he's like American muscle. He's like a 67 Mustang just out there, mm -hmm. you know, doing his thing. So the fact that she was like doing the whole Drake thing to this, to Austin St. John. And then all of a sudden Tommy <laughs> comes in and she's like, Boom. Mm -hmm. Give me a yep. piece of that. Bam. And then. I want a we... taste. <laughs> Mommy like. Yes. And you know who else wanted a taste? Rita Repulsa. Because she sees this as she's kind of prized in on the Rangers' personal lives at all times. I yeah. mean. Like an I, evil which, Santa Claus. Yeah. Overstepping completely because through that viewing globe, she could catch one. She clearly knows who they are and could go for them at any moment, but chooses not to. I guess that's kind of like, you know, high marks to her. Good job for like, you know, being nice and not going after them in their own homes. Uh, say, sort of thing. Just, just, I've always said, <laughs> why is Rita like, just, just wait until one of them's on the can mm -hmm. and then just go send putties in there with some shivs. <laughs> and that power ranger is, is no longer morphing. No. Okay. Like, no, <laughs> like, well, this is how I die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope say. No one finds me, and thank God I live in a time where I don't have to say delete my browser history because that's yeah. not a thing in '93. Your internet's moving too slow to download anything questionable. So, yeah. oh yeah, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but to to the point of that that whole thing though, she does send putties after Tommy when he's just mm -hmm. haplessly walking towards an empty alley. We're not quite sure why he's going there, but hey, that's where the action is. Yeah. And yeah, he survives the first test. Mm -hmm. He gets he right on through that. Yeah. So at this point, Rita recognizes the skills and against his will recruits as she puts yeah. him under kind of like initial quick spell where he's like, yes, I shall become your evil ranger by <laughs> Empress Rita. And uh fun part with this, it's also like 
clues that uh, you know they're they're definitely taking shit from a different show is that you see Rita in the alley with heavy shading. Yes. <laughs> so you, unless you pause and pay close attention, you do not see that it's not the same actress as who we've been seeing on screen this whole time. <laughs> It reminded me kind of like uh, Rick James on Dave Chappelle, you know, on Chappelle's show where he's like, you know, pulling him into the camera kind of thing, Mm -hmm. except instead of just a little bit of purple behind him, it's, it's everywhere, you know, like it's, (laughs) it's just covering, but like Rita's like, you know, Hey, Hey, come here, come here. Green Give it to me, baby. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which, which by the way, her little spell that she does and that, it had this, when they they spliced together her doing the whole spell for him, mm-hmm. it has this like eighties montage feel to it, yeah. where like the camera's <laughs> kind of panning over her at weird parts, and then it's like, mm-hmm. and then it goes up down, and and I, I just feel like we need to be hearing like Hearts on Fire or something from Rocky <laughs> Four. <laughs> <It's just, laughs> it, it just felt so weird uh, for that that sequence, but hey, it, you know, it, whatever. Like, it's it's like. Um, uh, our directors looked at this and said, you know what? We need a montage, but we're trying to hype up the bad <laughs> Ranger right now. And historically the villains don't get training montages. And when they do like Rocky three, it's spliced in with the heroes doing stuff too, but we've got 24 minutes to make this magic happen. So no music secret montage, and we're going to be of birth to the green Ranger. And this is also another case where, due to the limited amount of footage they had to use from Japan, when you actually have Rita putting him under the spell, he is encased in this white web-like substance, and then he arises to become the Green Ranger, except when he arises, it's definitely Burai from um, the Super Sentai show, and it's that actor. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it is clearly his outline because they did this whole thing like well it is heavily shaded it's really dark and it's like it's just the outline and then you just see the eyes except you clearly see that this is like early 90s japanese fashion poofy short hair and not that's right Tommy's that's right locks. i noticed that actually when i was watching it the other day <laughs> I, I looked at that and i go whose head mm-hmm. is that Cause it just doesn't make sense. No. You know, mm-hmm. like, look at that. That doesn't, that doesn't, that's not Tommy. No. There's no way. Not Tommy at all. But this guy does not F around. Like the Green Ranger no. morphs, gets into what is hands down, in my opinion, in the history of all Power Rangers, the single greatest suit of all time. And oh, that yeah. it is got this simplicity to it. Like the other Ranger costumes, um, the gloves and the boots, are only slightly different, which you get the large triangles instead of the diamonds. Mm -hmm. The dragon design of the helmet is similar to what was also going on, but just slightly different enough to be cool. And then the awesome dragon shield, which, again, not over the top. It is bold, and it's gold, so it sticks out, and it's somehow not ostentatious, like uh, (laughs) Iron Man's original all-gold look that he had before we added in the hot rod red. I just, I just love that, that the, the idea that the Green Ranger is holding back on fashion here. Mm-hmm. It's like, <laughs> could this be more? Yes, but no. Simple <laughs> says a lot. Yeah, I should say, like, yeah. it's like, should the mm-hmm. sleeves be entirely gold? It's like, no, no, no. I, don't know. I just want rings, and I just want mm-hmm. them around my buys and my tries. Okay, I want mm-hmm. nothing else. Just, just no. do that. Thank and- you. And while we we could really go like at this episode for episode and talk about um, like the detail of it, let's just talk about from this point moving forward in this episode and in one is just how hard the Green Ranger goes here because he one goes straight to the command center and boom takes out Zordon and takes out Alpha Five like <laughs> like nothing like leadership is just shot for the for the Power Rangers. Um, because it's revealed that only if you have a power coin and Rita had one the whole time, but for some reason never uses it herself was waiting for the right time, waiting for the right person to give the coin to. And this was, this was that time in person. So he gets in, (laughs) messes up the command center and then does one V five against the other Rangers. And how does that go for them? Mark? Uh, it goes quite poorly, especially (laughs) when they get hit by his sword and then sparks go flying. And yes. then you see those mm-hmm. burn marks on the Rangers that mm-hmm. kind of come and go throughout the fights. Oh, they, yeah. <laughs> very, mm-hmm. very, very inconsistent <laughs> what they splice together. Mm-hmm. But uh, what I want to point out really quick is how he takes out Alpha 5. 
because it is done with a very high tech piece of machinery, otherwise known as the CD ROM. Yes. <laughs> it was, it's the future and it's going nowhere. It's like 300 file cabinets on a single disc mark. It's not to be trifled with. I'm going to take over the command center <laughs> with 300 <laughs> megabytes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but yeah yeah he he really did just just fuck shit up mm -hmm. and and as a as a child watching this you had seen the original five take out all kinds of weird you know monsters of the week every mm -hmm. week and nothing really seemed to ever keep them down for very long no but then suddenly one dude just manages to splice them all up and just completely take them off guard Gives them the damn business. <laughs> yeah, he does. Which makes mm -hmm. you wonder. It's like, you know, I never noticed like a Brinks security sign outside of the, you know, the Power Rangers yep. headquarters. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder, how could you have all this high tech and then not have a camera out there? Yeah, just something. Like, yeah. at least like, you know, like, you know, spring for Ving Rames to sit outside and just watch. <laughs> something. He would have been like, no. And you know what? Yeah. Ramsey would be like, you know what? Hey, respect. Yeah, we'll try something different. <laughs> I mean, they have the viewing globe in high definition, which, please, sir, may have another pixel. You know, they they could see things in this, <laughs> but but it felt like they couldn't see a whole lot on that that viewing globe. But yeah, oh. he he completely comes in there, tears shit up, and I think what was really jarring for most of us was that you see the Power Rangers in you know their their Megazord mm -hmm. time and time again. Yeah, and unfortunately, when I say time and time again, I'm not exaggerating. It is the same fight sequence every, every single time. time. <laughs> yeah, they call the sword down, the sword, you know, I'm going to yeah. wag it around the same way I always do and then kill shit with it. Wah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except this time, the Green Ranger actually ports inside of that motherfucker and like just, just anger beats all of them like two kids in a school bus, you know, <laughs> the bottom of his fist, just fucking shit up inside oh of the bag gosh. sword. Which, and then he throws each one of those fuckers out of out, there. Just right just, out. Just, just the, the overhead <laughs> shot of them, like, doing mm -hmm. their whole arm wagon. Uh, oh, just, my gosh. It was beautiful. And it just has to, you have to think, like, this whole time, like, so for 16 episodes, no one just thought to go in there? No one's just like, yeah. hey, you can just go in the door. You just it, kick them right yeah. out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when the, that's when the door says mm -hmm. like employees only, you know, do not enter yep. and people just observed it. It was the 90s. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it's really just a guideline. Go right it in. says I can't go in there. I'm going to trust mm -hmm. it. Okay. Yep. It's mm -hmm. a sign. Yep. You can mass produce these things, but Honor I'm going to trust it this time. Yeah. <laughs> but I think one yeah. of my favorite parts right before this episode closes or this fight closes is one, when Tommy actually go when the Green Ranger goes out to fight them, he actually doesn't have a weapon. No dragon dagger yeah. yet. No sort of darkness yet. No blaster. But he does take one of the blasters from the other Rangers to use because they have like a, like a dagger feature. And yeah. uses their own weapons to like beat the snot out of them. And at one yeah. point, Jason's basically like, "Hey, one v one me," and and Green Ranger's like, "Sure," and just chucks the dagger right at him and takes him out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> just brilliant. Just so good. And that's where we end up leaving episode one. Is the Rangers have been defeated? Zordon's out. Alpha Five is got a virus, and he's done uh, for the yeah. time being. And it leads us in to episode two, where things actually, believe it or not, somehow get worse for everyone because Rita feels the need that one, knowing that her spell is actually only temporary, needs to find a better solution that's more long-term. And that long-term answer is the Sword of Darkness, mm. which guarantees the spell to last for as long as the sword is not destroyed. Foreshadowing, everyone. Uh <laughs> Because so, we gotta have a plot plot yeah. twist, right? Mm -mm. Yep. It's like uh, it's like dark magic Viagra, and she just pumps it right into Tommy. Mm -hmm. Yep, just boom. He wants one. Also, cool looking sword. Uh, the thing is just <laughs> yeah. all sorts of like bendy, curvy. It's got the the distraction red tassel like dangling <laughs> off of it, so that way you're looking at the red, and then boom, death. Uh, but. Also, fun production note with this is, I guess a lot of the fun production notes for this episode are going to be, so when you look at what they used for this from the original Japanese source material, turns out it didn't add up with what was going on on screen, because when they had the 
um, the Black Knight, who the Sword of Darkness was supposed to have come from. It's just reuse from the same Super Sentai series everything else came from. And you see him, like, giving, you know, giving the business to uh, the uh, Black uh, Mammoth, Mammoth Ranger uh, from that series. And they're like, yes, it was his sword. He was so powerful and it was so great. And then... When you see him doing it and swinging around, clearly not the same sword they give Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a different sword. It's the 90s. We didn't yeah. notice. No. And, I mean, other shows did a lot worse. I do recall an episode of, of Knight Rider from the first season where Kit and, and Michael have to turbo boost off of a cliff and get to the bottom. And you see them, like, prepping themselves to get ready to go off. And when it cuts to the footage, it's what is very clearly some white boxy 70s land yacht going <laughs> over the cliff and again like if you're like well why is that bad well if that means you you don't know what's going on a night rider where the the car is a 1983 black pontiac trans am very much the opposite of the car that goes over and even though the scene of that happening lasts literal 1.5 seconds we saw it <laughs> was it the same <laughs> car <laughs> it reminds me of Danger Five when Hitler jumps through the same window in like every episode. If you've ever seen that, he escapes the same way through the same window, and they just flip the images so that it looks different. But we all know they're making fun of that type of thing. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would say for the stuff I didn't really seem to notice as much, especially with mm -hmm. some of these production things, like you mentioned, was the fact that like I I, I want to say Jason David Frank was one of the few people who actually had to act on this show. Yeah. And, and, and it comes through because he, he essentially plays two different Tommies because, you know, there's the, oh man, the, the soft spoken Tommy who's like, yeah, let's, let's go out after, yeah. after, you know, after school, we'll, we'll go mm -hmm. hang out. And then there's the Tommy who's just angry all the time and angsty. Mm -hmm. The world then, doesn't revolve around you, Kimberly. <laughs> Which, I mean, really, when you're looking at like even that statement of him using it, like, like seriously, he's like, oh, dude, dick move. Like, doesn't the world doesn't revolve around you? It's like, but the plan was for you to meet her, and you didn't show up, and she was Waste, worried. Come wasted on, wasted opportunity for him to like flip his ponytail back and then just oh, like yeah. walk out of there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but oh I mean, he, he had mm -hmm. actually behave differently mm -hmm. than he normally you know would have, and in other episodes of the Power Rangers, like you see, uh, uh, like Billy and Kimberly have to play like these these bad versions yeah. of themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're bad actors, <laughs> but it is a little rough to get through those episodes. And I mean, and to the credit of David Yost and Amy Jo Johnson, I think they were, they were going over the top of going, that on, yes, on purpose. They were. Whereas Jason David Frank had to actually pull off that he's being bad and yeah. in a believable way. And that the way to do that is, you know, just kind of be a dick, not actually be, mean or like trying to be evil like we saw Kimberly and Billy doing in a previous episode it was just no I'm going to try and make you feel bad for feeling the way you feel and that was yeah, that's what was he did with Tommy it was screwed up mm -hmm. yeah like like that's that's some actual mental warfare going on mm -hmm. you know that's not just some person waking up and just being like hey you know what I have a rough situation at home so I'm going to be mean to you this was like no 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 it's like this guy's like hate fucking your mind right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, it, it was brutal. Like it, yeah. for a kid's show, it was brutal. It was harsh. And, and even more credit to his, to his early acting chops here is when we see him play Tommy versus evil Tommy and even the green ranger, he's different for all three of them. Uh, is yeah. that it's not just like when he's evil Tommy, he's kind of like cool, but you fucking suck for thinking the way yeah. you do. But Green Ranger is a little bit of gravel to the voice and much higher energy to what he's doing. And this is where you get a little more of the he's being evil for the sake of being evil. But even then, not really. Like, he's evil because he fully believes uh, in helping the person who he's mentally being enslaved by. Is he believes he's doing the right thing by helping her out. And, you know, he's evil in the process. So it just, it worked. It worked very well for what he did. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th I thought he pulled it off pretty well. And, and that's why I've said this since I was even a teenager, young, preteen. I thought he was one of the few mm -hmm. people who was actually acting on the show. Yep. Because uh, Austin St. John, most of the time, all he had to be was like, 
Tyrannosaurus. Or, okay, guys, we got to take this message, you know, and then look down mm-hmm. at his watch. And it's like, okay, not yeah. asking a whole lot of you guys. But then suddenly, mm-hmm. like you mentioned, we're asking someone to basically have split personality or personality syndrome. It's a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. And but, we, yeah. I, we, we will cycle back to that after we get through um, the five episodes again, when we, when we always wrap up by talking about like the legacy a show has, I think speaking to how Jason David Frank uh, portrayed Tommy in these five episodes, I would, I want to say even, I think it is well established what that did for the show. Um, but what this series does with each episode is up the stakes on just how devastating of an effect the Green Ranger has on the rest of the Power Ranger team. So like in the modern day, we talk about like the MCU and like the fantastic build we had to Thanos. Uh, but before we had that, to quote a meme, you know, it wasn't quite the same as getting home from school every day and just see the green ranger give the absolute business to the other five rangers for five straight episodes like he did. Well, I was going to say this was, this is when Jason literally gets kidnapped and Mm -hmm. sent to the dark dimension, you know, for some, some good old, there are four lights conversations with Goldar Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was, that was actually kind of gut wrenching when you're a kid, Mm -hmm. like, cause you don't know, is he going to make it? Mm-hmm. You know, are they, are they going to get them out of there? Yeah. You know, do they have the technology? Turns out they didn't. They did. But no, <laughs> that, that, that was pretty screwed up. Like it, he's not just mm-hmm. a prisoner, like Goldar's fighting him and he's got nothing mm-hmm. and he's progressively getting sweatier the longer he's in there. <laughs> yes. Like the, the fear is absolutely real in <laughs> that he's like, I am probably going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, wow, this, this could be, this could be how I end. And yeah. I, I will give Austin St. John some credit. I know I just, I just made fun of him for his acting <laughs> ability, but mm-hmm. you know, seeing him all, all sweaty and like <laughs> kind of fearful in that, that scenario, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a lot different in tone. I mean, the, the tone had always been kind of goofy. Yeah. There were some stakes, like you mentioned that weren't very mm-hmm. high until this point. And yeah, it became dramatic for the, for this, this stretch, you know, I mean, kidnapping is dramatic anyway, but very, yes. Yeah. I mean, you got kidnapping. Um, we have, uh, property damage. Uh, we have psychological warfare. Um, got B and E, got some B and E, yeah, you know, some B&E the, in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the headquarters. I yeah. I, I don't even, I don't even know what, what you would call doing to Zordon. Cause he just kind of like loses his signal. Like that's, it's not really murder. Um, because he's still alive, he's just scattered out there. But I digress. So basically, um, every <laughs> Legally, episode we don't have a term for that. We yet. don't know. Like lawyers would struggle. They're like, well, there is no law, so we can't really try him for that. However, everything else, yes. Just saying that one, we got nothing on the books here, kid. We just, we the don't DA know what like, to do. I'm pretty sure we can get him on four other charges that have nothing to do with that. Okay, yes. so let's mm-hmm. just table that for now. Yes, <laughs> maybe so, there's some precedent we don't know about. Yep. We'll Sorry, David J. Fielding, but we are at a loss for words. What could have been done for you and your situation? This is <laughs> definitely where Hupy Abraham and Habis Habish and Rotier and whatever happened to Davis, all of them don't know what to do. I, I could just imagine David J. Fielding, if he does listen to this, like just slamming his table and going, it's my money and I want it now. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. <laughs> No, Which, JG Wentworth is not a sponsor of this program, by the no, way, but no, mm-mm. we don't get Although a chance we, to reference it much. We are open to sponsors. If you, if <laughs> JG Wentworth would like to give us money now, you know, yeah. anytime's really appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> Something I, I appreciated and also questioned a little bit mm-hmm. was, was the introduction of Scorpina in, in this sequence, right? Because mm-hmm. it feels like she kind of comes out of nowhere. And, yep. and it's like Rita is just like spinning a wheel and whatever it lands on, we're going to incorporate that into the episode. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I just never really cared for was Scorpina. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She kicks a lot of ass. She does. Yeah. She's this like half scorpion, half Asian woman that doesn't mm-hmm. fit the aesthetic of anything else going on. But when they show her appear in that giant, like squishy rock thing. Yeah. And then they specifically zoom in on a scorpion that's just happened to crawl along that one specific part of that rock. 
<laughs> I laughed as a child. I laughed as an adult. Mm-hmm. I'm sure when I'm like eight, like if I make it to 80 years old, I'll be laughing my ass off at it then. Mm-hmm. It just didn't fit for me. No, it it definitely, I'm trying to remember if that's when that character actually even gets introduced in the, like the, uh, the Sentai version. I'm not positive she does. And also, I think her name is Lemmy, not nearly as intimidating as Scorpina. So good job, localization efforts on that one. So yeah, it felt out of place, but things that didn't feel out of place that I actually think were pretty well done is, so here we have a character when you see her, she, it's like Rita Repulsa, it's, it's the actual actress in her mouth moving. And I have to say, at least for what we see in this episode, which by the way, was supposed to be called Desperately Seeking Scorpina, but they ended up changing it. They're like, ah, we can't go with that one. Um, <laughs> her dubbing is actually pretty solid. Like, I think it, it, it lines up well with what uh, it looks like the, uh, the actress is saying in Japan. Uh, so they did a good job with localizing those lines to make them work. So I will yeah. give that an effort. What I was confused about is how at one at no point when Scorpina was interested that red, blue, and black weren't just like, Hear me out. What if we get her to switch teams? <laughs> because, and it, it has nothing to do with your thinking. It's not because we think she's hot, but she's a little hot. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I'm not saying I'm, but yeah, imagine that, that voiceover with just the mm-hmm. helmets and going like, cause <laughs> obviously they're not seeing their faces, just the helmets. And they're like, you know, like, it's like when the Mandalorian does that, like a head tilt and it tells yep. you everything you need to know. I could just mm-hmm. imagine what that would look like. Oh my God. Here. <laughs> Conversation here. Which, <laughs> like, and even like, I know I bring that up because this was definitely where like my young self had mixed feelings because like Kimberly is the first crush of all time, like TV crush. But then Scorpina comes in like, you know, 19 episodes later, it's like, wait a sec. I was going to say phone. Scorpina is looking like a little Debbie pack of snacks after a, a, a baseball game, and <laughs> mm-hmm. and you're about to bust that box open. I mean, she she she's a good looking lady. Yep. Yeah, I, and- I can imagine just seeing like the red. They just pan to the Red Ranger, and you just see his helmet, and all you can just hear him go is. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then at one point, like the yellow ranger just slaps and it's like, I didn't think that helmet could get any redder there, Jason. And yet here we are, <laughs> which speaking on that, um, the whole, like the yellow ranger thing for another thing, if you're unaware of the original series, uh, the yellow ranger is a character, uh, boy in the, uh, in the super That's sentai right. series. And when I say yeah. boy, I do say B O Y because that was his name. The boy's <laughs> name was boy. Uh, in the original series. So that's why also, if you ever wondered why the Yellow Ranger didn't have a skirt, but the Pink Ranger did, it's because the majority of the action scenes you see, it's a dude. But, I mean, I digress. So uh, back to Scorpina. She is what you'd call an ass kicker in this uh, in this episode, though. She basically comes in and, you know, hands all five Rangers their tails just as efficiently as the Green Ranger did. So we get this new like long-standing villain for the show who is basically going to be kind of like a Goldar equivalent. Whereas while Goldar, we kind of see how like he never successfully like finishes the Ranger uh, Rangers off ever at the same time. Yeah. He's also never killed by them. He is yeah. only ever temporarily defeated. And now we get someone who's in the same vein, who is just as feared by her peers as she is by the people who used to have to fight her. Um, even, Elf is like, I was happy not to see her face for 10,000 years because like they were afraid of Scorpina. So she is very, very much like infamous in the, uh, the Ranger uh, lexicon. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure she's got some parking tickets in her past, you know, (laughs) maybe Mm -hmm. she, uh, she mislabeled a a UPC when she went through the self-checkout. I mean, she's Mm -hmm. an evil, evil lady. Yes. Yes. The question I always had mm-hmm. about Scorpina, though, is that if she could just as easily kick the asses like wholesale of the Power Rangers team, mm-hmm. does the Green Ranger really have as much punch at that point? That is something because it does take away from it a little bit. And because like physically, they, they do seem like they could be equals at that point in time. Like, did you really need him? But I'm going to say... To a degree, yes, you still do, when I even to agree, because, well, look at where we started off. Uh, 
the Green Ranger didn't start off by fighting the other Rangers. He started off by taking up the command center, which they Very do true. say is is something that like they can't do without a power coin. And we, one thing that they they will admit on the series is initially like we're making this like again for uh, the tweens and the early teens at this point, and we don't need a ton of backstory to entertain them. So there was not a lot of that thought being put into this uh, as far as like backstory for the characters. You literally just needed a one sentence reason to justify that character's badassery and like, okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, so as far as like, why couldn't you just give like Scorpina or Goldar or literally anyone else the power coin? We don't know why, but apparently it just had to go to a human because so far only humans have them. And that's yeah, all we and- needed at that age. And a sudden need for the Megazord to be solar powered that we we find mm-hmm. out that <laughs> that Rita can literally summon a whole ass eclipse out of nowhere mm-hmm. that she never could have before in the previous 16 episodes. Yeah. And, you know, it, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's what we get in episode four is the big thing again to make things even bigger and worse for the Rangers is we've gotten rid of leadership. Uh and now we've got to get rid of the Megazord because that is the next biggest threat we could have here. Because actually, I think it is in like just the previous episode, in episode three, um, when we were Jasonless and Zordonless, and Tommy went and fought the other four Rangers, was about to win, and they're like, "Fuck this! Let's just get the Megazord." <laughs> he doesn't yeah. have anything that can fight that, uh, and they have to use the Megazord to stop the Green Ranger, who is just normal human sized. That's also the first time we ever see the mammoth head <laughs> actually being used as a shield in that episode. It's been yeah. done for like promotional material, the toys and everything didn't happen until episode, uh, 18, 19, 19. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was 19, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So we finally get that, but you know, now into the second to last episode, we've got to take the Megazord out and Rita summons the eclipse to weaken the solar power of the Megazord. And this is, I think, actually how too many people came to understand solar power is through this episode because we see as soon as the sun's covered, the Megazord's energy just drops and it's useless without the sun. And that is not how solar panels actually work. Um, The ones we have are actually much more efficient and hold on to the energy from the daytime so you can use it at night still. But the Megazord can't quite do that, which also rings the question, Rita, why the fuck don't you just attack at night? Literally, the Megazord can't come out because it absolutely needs the sun there. So just come out at night. Either you attack them when they're taking a shit, or you just attack them at night. But no, Rita, she needs mm-hmm. her eight hours. Okay, Joe, like, yep, beauty sleep, she, get it. She when the yeah when the Rangers are down, it's kind of <laughs> like when my kids are down. It's mm-hmm. like, yep, I rest when they rest. It's the same idea. Yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous <laughs> when you actually think about it. Mm-hmm. But I, I would say this though, yes, it's a five part series, mm-hmm. and yes, in the next episode, like after the Megazord is effectively shut down, yeah, we do end up getting the first appearance of the Dragon Zord. Yes. Which here, here's what I'm gonna say. Mm-hmm. Dragon Sword I thought was really cool. Yep. Big fan. Okay. Mm-hmm. Big fan. I love dinosaurs. I even love it when they become robots. What I don't understand is why the Dragon Sword was designed like Alfred Hitchcock and it just kinda <laughs> scuttles onto the field. It does have know? some bulk. <laughs> it, it, the, the, the dragon sword is a thick bitch. Okay. Mm-hmm. He is a, he's a massive thing and there is no way he's moving as fast as, I no. mean, unless the dragon sword is like Warren Sapp. If you remember the Buccaneers <laughs> defensive lineman, mm-hmm. unless he had a get up and go like Warren Sapp, I don't see how that thing's moving as fast as it is. I don't either. Uh, I got nothing uh, because this this falls in the range of from Japanese explanation. These these are definitely super robots. In which case, they look like robots. How they work, no clue. They just say. do, and they they do their thing. They do it well. And so, if you ask, like, "Hey, how do you do this?" and you're just like, "You know what? I'm a kick ass beat 'em up machine, not a see how you do it machine." You get nothing. I- yeah, but he walks like he just finished his fourth plate at Pizza Ranch. Okay, like he <laughs> he's he's not this like sleek looking, you know, uh, transformer type thing. Like yeah. 
<laughs> like, I feel like as he's coming out of the ocean, he should be followed by maybe a smaller Zord that's just playing it like a, a baritone behind him. So, yeah, some kind of large oh. brass instrument. Oh, my gosh. I mean, he as far as the Zord goes, that baby got back. Uh, we will <laughs> definitely say that for the Dragon Zord. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, dude. yeah, I mean, he's just cool. I mean, yeah, he's he's got some thickness. You know what? Maybe... He is like the athlete of the American dream. He is the first baseman who can just not crap out of the park, but he gets someone to run for him if he only gets a single. That's yeah. that's where he yeah. comes in. So he's like, he's like a Mike Tyson, okay? Like he's got a little bit thicker, you know, <laughs> midsection. But if mm-hmm. he gets in close on you, you're you're screwed. You know, yeah. that's that's kind of when I because he doesn't have very long arms either. No, he doesn't. <laughs> but he does have missiles waiting for you in the fingers. He so, does. Yeah. Yep. He, whenever he puts his hands up straight like this, I feel like it's a perfect time to be like, call an ambulance, but not for me. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's it's hilarious. They always do that zoom in on his hands right when he does that. Mm-hmm. And they're like perfectly like 90 degrees with thumb. And then you just see the yes. little rocket shoot off mm-hmm. of it. And another thing, like speaking of like the perfect zoom ins for the Dragon Zord and, and his artillery, another great thing that he has is a massive drill at the end of his tail. Yes. And at one point, we do get a 1v1 between the Dragon Zord and the T-Rex uh, Zord. Yes. yes and right. we actually see the T-Rex catch the tail. But when we want the big reveal over, hey, this is a drill, motherfucker, and don't you be grabbing it. Um, when you see the drill, it becomes baby sized as yes. the T Rex is like struggling to fight it before yes. eventually getting hit by moving away. It's like I'm trying to think of like so clearly we see the big tail turn. Wouldn't it be more impressive that the big one is turning? Is it was it because it they literally couldn't hold it to the chest? Because again, like if you are familiar with anything that is Japan from the sixties through the nineties, it's these are all dudes in suits. Um, yes. There is there is no special effect here that doesn't involve wires. So I don't know if maybe the actor couldn't just hold it with the big tail or what, but the big tail going to the small tiny one definitely lost a little bit of the the imposing nature that i think they're trying to get off with here it definitely it definitely mm-hmm. did it, it felt like it was dipped in ice water between <laughs> scenes or something <laughs> but mm-hmm. but the, the truth is though like this this five episode like epic we'll call it mm-hmm. the the escalating like series of action and and just what goes on with it like for for a kid show th- this felt big you know, mm-hmm. this, this felt like a a massive like MCU style of event that happened in the the early '90s, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it culminates with the Red Ranger and the Green Ranger finally getting their one on one, and and that's what I like. You saw all this like big spectacle and all this cool shit, mm-hmm. but still whittles down to how it starts. Yep, it goes Which right you- back to how the whole thing begins, mm-hmm. and it's like it's like someone actually thought this through. It's not just yeah. a dumb kids show. <laughs> Absolutely, because that's, I mean, that's even the thing. Like, you can you can look at things that haven't aged well. Like, I like I remember, like, watching He-Man when I was a kid. I can't watch He-Man anymore. Um, the original cartoon, I tried watching it with my nephew, and I have to hold back from laughing every episode. Um, even watching some Generation 1 Transformers. I loved Transformers growing up. Watching Optimus Prime do a slam dunk, not the same effect when I am older uh, as it was when I was a kid. But this show, like, they're going to have the same thing. So there are going to be some episodes that just really don't hold up. The biggest thing is that, you know, you can't wear a polo with overalls anymore and have it be cool. That's just not a thing. Uh, some things are very 90s, and they are absolutely a time capsule that, like, you try showing your kids today, and they'll be like, why are they dressed? They'll ask why they're dressed like that. It's going to happen. But this is something that didn't disappoint for the genre, for its audience. We've talked about how like Transformers the movie like scarred people <laughs> because like yeah. they have kids refusing to come out of their out of their room. And that eventually does happen with this series too. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit in the legacy of it all. But it was basically we had some hype for it. With, with commercials coming up, like, ooh, a sixth ranger, but ooh, he's a bad guy. Ooh, there's this new guy in town, and he's just, he's got sweet high jump kicks like Jason does, or even better. So we've got this hype for it. 
And I don't think anyone who watched the show was disappointed by that hype when they first saw it. And watching it as an adult now, I can still watch this five episode arc and enjoy every minute of it. I'll, I'll of course get to laugh over like, like the fashion choices of the time, <laughs> uh, because like that, that is definitely a victim of 1993. Um, but again, the acting isn't bad for what is essentially like the first big break for every actor on that show. This is their first really go at some, at a big go at something. Um, the script again, from one episode to the next, like you said, actually was planned and well thought out of having this opening episode with lots of foreshadowing, having the story escalate every single episode and then culminate by ending the same way it came back to open in this beautiful circular storytelling. So this is a group of writers who sat down and for all intents and purposes, really took care of a property that was meant to be, I mean, kind of a cash grab when you look at way this way this way Saban set this whole thing up was how can I make money without spending a lot? And you had people who were in charge of making that dream of it being success actually come true with writing it and carrying it out and putting the raw in it. And it rings through in every episode here, even despite like the little things we make fun of over how this is clearly Sentai footage that doesn't quite match up with what they were trying <laughs> to do here. But even with those things, like those are things that you don't notice when you're a kid and seeing it for the first time. And I would even argue that if you're an adult and you watch it the first time, you might miss them too. You won't now because you heard us talk about them and you're going to be looking for them. But if you're not paying close attention, yeah, you'll probably just let it slide because you legitimately get caught up in the story. I, I'm not even ashamed to admit it. I've watched this series, this, this five episode arc several times, and it wasn't just the first time it was on TV. I would come back and watch it uh, as, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I found it online as an adult and yeah, now that my son loves, loves Power Rangers. Him and I have actually watched it more than once together. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's high stakes, man. This yeah. is, this is real shit. This is real life, Joe. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. consequences. Okay. <laughs> but it, it, mm -hmm. it did some really cool things. I mean, as we've talked about off the show, you know, and, and during some parts of it, we do end up getting this new dynamic with the sixth Ranger that, mm -hmm would persist throughout the series, you know, after this point, well, there was a little bit of a break, but for the rest of Mighty Morphin, you know, we, we would have that dynamic um, mm -hmm. once the White Ranger gets introduced. And, and yeah, I mean, JDF had such an influence that when he begins to lose his powers later on in this series, or this season, mm -hmm. it, it sucked. Yeah. It really sucked to have to mm -hmm. say goodbye to him because he's so cool. And it's like, shit, we're losing mm -hmm. him. And yeah. so, yeah, the, the yeah. whole fact that, that this cemented him as, and, and he wasn't even just cool because of uh, the stuff that you typically get wrapped up in, like, mm -hmm. you know, leather jackets and, you know, putting cigarettes <laughs> out in your arms and that kind of mm -hmm. shit. Like he was just cool because he was, he was good to people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and I feel like JDF as a person shown through in this character. Mm -hmm. And and immediately it's it's like positivity. I remember seeing like a, on a VHS or something when he was addressing people at like a mall or something, and all the actors are in their in their outfits, and he was stressing the importance of setting goals mm -hmm. and and how to how to achieve those goals and that kind of stuff. And he's addressing this to kids that were my age, you know. Yeah, and. And that continued to come through at the ends of these episodes where he, mm -hmm. he would have a message. They would, they would tell you about things, you know, how, how to be nice to people if you're upset and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So uh, th that impact was, was tremendous. And as a kid, that was something you needed to hear. It was, come, it was, this was the show that was bringing it to you. Yeah. And, and that package did it perfectly. I mean, when you look at other attempts at doing these, like I think of like, how G.I. Joe, after the episodes, there'd be like this after school special, like, hey, kids, don't you do drugs now? Stay in school and all that fun stuff. <laughs> and Power Rangers did in a way which, you know, as an adult, you can look back and you can see the message and the way they're presenting. Like, you know what? It's probably a little cheese ballish. But as as a kid, like, 
like even the GI Joe stuff, it's like, oh, okay, I can change the channel now. I don't need to see that. But like the way this wove that into the episodes and into the story where it basically gave you the sitcom breakdown of a moral lesson without the need for the soft violin in the background and everything to slow down for you. It just culminated through the story and they found ways to do that every episode. And I think that's one of the best legacies of, of this, of this five episode series is that you get a character who ends up making mistakes. And it, I mean, clearly like this is a character who, um, you know, it's not his choice that he made these mistakes and he came in with the best of intentions and it ended up being forced into doing things he would not have wanted to do otherwise. But yeah. how easy would it have been at the end of it for Zoran to be like, nah, we beat you. You're done, kid. Uh, hit the road. And then Tommy is just out on the streets because of all of the pain and anguish he just caused over the past five episodes, but instead takes him in and says, hey, we, I understand you've got a good heart, you're a good person, uh, and you were caught in a bad situation, and we're going to make the best of that. Yeah. And again, really can't say this enough over just how much, again, Jason David Frank really brought it to this character. I know you've, you've, you've mentioned it a lot this episode. And that's where like part of the legacy of the show will go off of like the Power Rangers legacy and the just Jason David Frank's legacy that he had on it. Because he did such an amazing job. When he signed on for Power Rangers, depending on what video you watch, there are some videos where I, I swear I've heard Jason David Frank say he was signed on for six episodes. And then um, official reports say 14. In other, uh, in other con uh, conventions, he says he was signed on for 14 episodes. But that was the deal. We knew the Green Ranger died in Japan. Uh, so his character had to be either be killed off or written off in some some fashion. And when you said and brought up that like we see this slow loss of power in the Green Ranger to the point where he ends up powerless. And he did such an amazing job that when that happened, it was very much just like Optimus Prime dying. We had people coming up to Jason David Frank and other people saying like, my kid is crying. My kids, my kid doesn't want to come out of his room because Tommy's gone. It was his favorite character. You meant so much because you were again, like this bad kid who this good kid in a bad situation who brought it back. And even something as small, like the fact that, you know, like I always tried looking for the best in situations growing up and I still do. And that was a trait that I share with them. The fact that I forget things everywhere. And there's a whole episode dedicated to how forgetful Tommy is is something that, yeah. that rang with me when I was a kid. So like, I could see how like Optimus losing Optimus prime is again, like that's losing your father. Losing Tommy is like losing your best friend. Like it was hard for kids to go through. So when we actually said earlier that it was Jason David Frank was gonna be signed on uh, as the lead for VR troopers, he was going to be replaced by um, the character who actually ended up being the lead on that show. Oh, that, Brad Hawkins. That, Brad Hawkins was going to be yeah. the White Ranger. He's going to be introduced as like I think like Johnny Steele or Jason, not Jason Steele. I have a Jason, but something Steele. And then because of all of the letters and all of the calls that Fox and Saban were getting, they're like, "So Jason David Frank, we know we promised you like the lead on this other show, but hear us out." Tommy comes back, <laughs> and he gets to be the White Ranger, and I think. Looking at how things turned out, um, I could not imagine a world where he didn't say yes to that. Like, not ha like if to when, not, admittedly, like I watched the series in secret from my friends because I kept with it for quite a while. I watched it all the way until Tommy leaves in Turbo, and then after that, like I, I caught like a few episodes here and there of In Space and things. It wasn't until like literally two thousand and four. My brother calls me and says, you're never going to believe it, but Tommy's back on Power Rangers as a full-time character that I got into it again uh, for Dino Thunder. But anyway, um, when he comes back, literally the moment where he unmasks from the White Ranger, I think every kid watching that show who was saddened by the fact that Tommy was gone, like, like their hearts just cranked up to 11. Like they were beyond happy to see Tommy come back. And for Jason David Frank to stick with the franchise as long as he did and not shy away from it. Like there are so many people who can say like, you know what? 
it was a role. I'm ready to move on. I do, I've done other things. And never once has he ever done that with fans. He's always been like, no, this was me. That was all of it. I'm so happy you still like look back on it fondly and you can come to me and be appreciative. So the fact that he stuck with it for all of those seasons was just incredible. Like for, for what he gave to all of us to the point where we can still be thankful that we had him to do that for so long. And when you look at like what it's done for Power Rangers in itself, I mean, look at how many times Jason David Frank's come back uh, as, as Tommy and we get to see him be the Green Ranger. We don't know how he got a Master Morpher and he can be the Green Ranger again. And I can tell you, no one gives a flying fuck. We are just happy that he's green and we get to see him do all this stuff again. And every Sixth Ranger since then, I mean, obviously, again, like this is this is the first like exposure to the original that I had, but to me, has not come close to what he was able to do. No, it, it was just so uh, paradigm mm -hmm. shifting, breaking, however you want yeah. to call it. That too, green's just a cool color. It's been oh, my yeah. mm -hmm. it's been my favorite color for a long time. Just even with like my TMNT days, you know, like green, green was just cool. Mm -hmm. and, and so to have him go through this like evil and then redemption arc and all of that, it, it was a lot for a, a live action kids show to try and pull off, and they yeah. they did it really well. I, I that's I still still really enjoy it. But to your mm -hmm. point about Jason David Frank and embracing something where you know i'm not calling out any actors specifically but you you hear of actors tiring over a role mm -hmm. and rather than be thankful they're spiteful and it just feels kind of weird for yeah. for him to do the opposite and to be thankful and and to forcibly thank people for their <laughs> their enthusiasm he never missed a beat and mm -hmm. that that's what i think is is so earth shattering for a lot of a lot of people and obviously us included. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for that, I'm thankful that we did get to spend as much time with, with him as we did. And that's, that's not normal. You don't, no. you don't see someone live through a role like that and revisit it, you know, five or six times in, mm -hmm. in the course of 20 years or 20 plus years. And so <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. And I think that's what hurts is that, you know, he won't be able to do it again. Yeah. Except for his his yet to be released movie, yes, which mm -hmm. is coming out. Um, I always forget the name of it. Is the White it's Dragon or Legend, the, of, Legend of, the of the White, White Dragon. Dragon? And it is very much. It is not attached to any Power Ranger property at all. So he's not Tommy Oliver. There is no his characters and exist in the Power Rangers. It was he his and Bat and the Sons, uh, the production company. Their idea of how can we make a Power Ranger or Sentai esque show for the adults who grew up watching Power Rangers. And it'd be something they could enjoy now. And yeah. instead of doing it like, well, let's do Power Rangers, but they're adults and they handle adult situations. It's like, let's actually completely remove it from that and keep some of the styling that the heroes would use and, and make it into a completely like its own story. Uh, I think uh, that's due out um, sometime next year in 2023. That's, that's cool. Yeah, I think the best we, thing we can do is support that project, mm -hmm. and as as much as it sucks, uh, is is to say goodbye to Jason David Frank and and the ways that we know how. And so that's kind of where I am with it, man. Mm -hmm. I know you've had a tough week. I know we, we've kind of been going back and forth about just how much this had an impact on us, and really, I, I think he'd be happy to know that we. Started off obviously pretty uh, torn up still this episode, but the fact that we were able to laugh about things together and and enjoy something that he did, mm -hmm. I think that just says a lot about you know what 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 influence he has on people. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so based on that, everybody, we're not going to sign off how we normally do. Uh, in lieu of our normal sign off, we instead want to offer condolences to the loved ones and fans of Jason David Frank. And to anyone suffering from suicidal thoughts or conditions that impact their mental health. Help is available, and in the United States, help can be found 24 hours a day by dialing 988 for the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Additional help can be found online at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org. We will also be sharing international resources in our show notes. And our DMs are always open. If you feel alone, message us. 
we're, we're more than happy to listen. So in closing, we do have a tribute for Jason David Frank that Joe actually created himself. We've pushed it out to our social media. So if you do listen to the audio version of this program, you can find it there. Um, but for those of you watching the YouTube video, we will be adding that now. So we know it's tough. It's probably tough to see, but we hope you enjoy this, this, this tribute to Jason David Frank. So I write a lot of poems and uh, I don't even remember all my poems. <laughs> this one's called Sunshine. I know you're familiar with this saying, when it rains it pours. But the good news is the sunlight will outweigh the rain. God has something bigger in store. All you have to do is pray. To me, it's insane. It's this mindset. When something bad happens, this is the story we claim. This negative thinking is ingrained for so many years. It's like programmed in our brain. Fact is, we all walk around with problems. It's called a dark cloud over our head because we never take the time to solve them. We don't need an umbrella. Just reach out, tell someone, tell them, a family member, a friend, if you don't have someone, just whisper with them. I promise he'll hear you. Just keep whispering over and over again. Life doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be dark every single day. It's time to let in the sun ray. This cloud has followed me for years. Every time I looked up, it's cold and the rain drops and falls on my face. But yet, it's my own tears. It's getting old. Realizing all it's doing is following your fears. Trust me, it can get warmer. Whatever outlet works for you, mine is writing and being a performer. Let's embrace this new outlook. Let's make this a new chapter in your book. Trust me. You will see God's job is never done. He always finishes his session. There has to be more to life than this depression. Let's stop running and have some fun. Hold yourself up high. It's time for you to be number one. Remember, all the positive power is in your mind. Because right now, 